Hello, we are now in Romano Guardini's book, The Lord, and we're on chapter 9 of part 5, the foot washing. So this is chapter 9, the foot washing. In the report on Jesus' last reunion, says Guardini with his disciples, we find the description of a strange incident, right, that has seldom failed to make a deep impression on the Christian consciousness. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things to his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples and dry them with the towel with which he was girded. He came then to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said to him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash thee, Thou shalt have no part with me. Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed need only to wash, and he, he is clean all over. And yet you are clean, but not all. For he knew who it was that would betray him. That is why he said, You are not all clean. Now, after he had washed their feet and put on his garments, when he had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If therefore I, the Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also to wash the feet of one another. In the ancient world, the antique world, uh, uh, Bordini says, we would say ancient, I think, guests invited to dine bathed and attired themselves freshly for the occasion. However, since everyone wore uh, sandals, dusty feet were unavoidable, at least for those not in a position to maintain a litter. Hence, upon arrival, the guest was received by a slave who washed his feet. In Luke 7, Jesus refers to the custom in his remark to Simon. I came into your house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. Obviously, the service was menial enough. The slave who performed it considered hardly worthy of so much as a glance. The participants in the little Paschal ceremony in Mark's house, okay, the apostles, had arrived that morning on foot from uh, Bethany and spent the whole day in the streets of Jerusalem, very likely. By evening, uh, they were a little bit worse for the wear, says Guardini. Neither their means nor the spirit of their community permitted them to keep a slave and possibly their appearance at table left much to be desired. This then, the natural background of the incident described, Jesus rises, girds himself with a towel, pours water into a basin, and goes from one to another, kneeling to perform the service of the slave at the door. Now we understand the atmosphere. It must have been loaded with mortal embarrassment. Only Peter, whose heart so often runs away with his tongue, finds words. Thou shalt never wash my feet. So Guardini asks a simple question. And he does not give a simple answer. He says, what does the scene signify? Clearly something profound. What could move a person to perform such a service voluntarily? Okay, so he, he offers different 
answers, as he is wont to do sometimes when he's looking at, when he's doing these sketches. He's going to offer different answers. First one, good-natured helpfulness, perhaps, readiness to serve. Or one could be conscious of the omission and free enough to take things in hand. Okay, so take charge kind of service, right? But the moment described here is far too huge for any such slight motive. Again, there are people who instinctively seek the lowest possible place. Uh, their inner uncertainty or a feeling of inferiority drives them to perform the most menial services in order to attain a certain inner truth. It is self-understood that Jesus' nature knows none of these. He's not doing it for the reasons of some kind of inner insecurity. That's what Gardini's pointing out, right? It's self-understood. On the contrary, after he has finished the task, he says, you call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Okay? That's important. He has acted in the full, pure consciousness of his authority. Or was Jesus only demonstrating how to overcome squeamishness and pride? That's another possibility, right? And at least one of the disciples must have, might have thought of performing the service for his brothers, but if he did, he probably dismissed the idea, as a man of simple origin would be likely to, fearful that it would be beneath his dignity. By performing himself this slave's task, the master burns the lesson once and for all into their hearts. The thought is clear, and Jesus' own words support it. If therefore I, the Lord and Master, uh, ellipsis, that as I have done to you, so you should do also." End of quote. But the moral is too obvious to cover the whole import of the act. Okay, So this goes beyond the moral of this story. Okay, That's what Wardini is getting at. And this is very important because our tendency is to just hang this story up on the moral of the story. That's what Guardini is warning against, okay? But, as he says, the moral is too obvious to cover the whole import of the act. Too pedagogic. Christ never acts moralistically, quote-unquote. According to Guardini, Christ never acts moralistically. The idea that Jesus was constantly setting an example has done much to spoil his sacred picture. Okay? Of course he was exemplary. The model, simply. But the figure of the Lord loses all spontaneity when it is constantly portrayed in pedagogic pose. Okay? So this isn't just about posing as a humble teacher doing the work of a slave. Okay? That's what Gordini is getting at. This is how Gordini warns about this interpretation. He says, through such an interpretation, something construed and unnatural creeps into his bearing. Something fundamentally at odds with his true self. No, Christ lived among his disciples spontaneously, doing from moment to moment what was, quote, right, unquote, without thinking particularly of the example he was giving, because he acted unconsciously, genuinely, from his essence outward, not the other way around. All he did was perfect. He is exemplary because in him Christian life begins. Okay? That's where the example works. Because from Jesus Christian life begins. He is its foundation, demonstrates what it stands for, and supplies the necessary strength to participate in it. 
quote, imitation of Christ, unquote, does not suggest that he be literally copied. Okay? This becomes really important, I think. There's a, that he be literally copied. There's a dash here in the book. What unnatural and pretentious situations would be the result? Sometimes when we're young and immature, we live out of what I, a friend of mine referred to as derivative consciousnesses. We see somebody we want to imitate and we start imitating their external attributes. And there's something like human about that and if it doesn't get carried away into false consciousness it might even be helpful, you know, in certain situations. But that is not what Guardini wants us to think about when we imitate Christ. He wants us imitating the fact that um, the Christian life in Christ and learn from his spirit to do hour by hour what is right, okay? So it's imitation in a deeper way than just sort of an external slavish imitation of the external. And that's what Guardini is talking about. He goes on, in an earlier discussion of how God approaches us through Jesus, we concluded that he, com he comes through love, okay? But a God who was only the endlessly loving one would not have acted as he did. There must be more to it than love. We've seen this theme before in Guardini. What's the more? What is more than love? And we discovered, says Guardini, that this more was humility. That's earlier in the book. Humility, says Guardini, is no human quality. The attitude of the little man who bows to the greater is not one of humility, but of truth. Genuinely humble is the greater man who bows before the lesser because in his eyes the little man has a mysterious dignity. Okay. That is humility. Okay. To recognize this dignity, to gather it up and bow before it, that is humility, okay? Humility springs from the Creator and is directed toward the creature. Uh, and uh, there's a semicolon there in Guardini, and he says, Tremendous mystery! Exclamation point. So remember, these are sketches of his considerations on the Lord, on the Lord Jesus. If Jesus is Lord, no one else can do the job. And here in this sketch, you, the, even the structure of the sentence is worth thinking about. Humility springs from the Creator and is directed toward the creature. Semicolon. Tremendous mystery exclamation point. Then, he says, the incarnation is the fundamental humility on which all human humility rests. Hear this again. The incarnation is the fundamental humility on which all human humility rests. And then, Surprise, surprise, he puts in parentheses scriptures that he wants us to think about right there and then. He doesn't quote the whole scripture, but you've heard me quote it so many times you're probably tired of it. But right there at the end of that statement, Guardini quotes Philippians 2, 5 to 10. What was that? His state was divine. He did not cling to equality with God, something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. There it is. 
kenosis. So we, Gordini is putting incarnation and kenosis together. By the way, uh, when I did that, I did it, sort of stumbled into it. I was asked to teach remedial doctrine at a local school. Uh, the school happens to be across the street from my house. And um, uh, Trinity. And I was teaching the tutorial group. And it turned out that that year, I was the second one chosen. They chose someone who, who was really, I think, in some ways, a better religion teacher than me to the, to the youth. Uh, but his schedule didn't allow him to do it. So uh, the, the person running the tutorial came to me as a, a second chance or second best. And I was certainly second best for that. And yet I was asked to, to teach it, and it was doctrine, okay? So obviously I'm going to teach uh, the incarnation uh, to these uh, children, uh, I mean students, young teenagers, in the uh, tutorial. Uh, and yet when I was teaching incarnation, I had to teach self-emptying. Because as it turned out, this particular group had had a had one of the people. They they it was like a one room school situation where different grades were together, and so the different grades were together. And it turned out that one of the graduates of the tutorial had died that August in a tragic accident. And so I was asked to come into this classroom and teach doctrine. And I knew that with the suffering, that, that their loss of this uh, person who had just graduated from Trinity, uh, from that tutorial group, was very heavy on their hearts. His brother was even in the classroom. Okay, So this was really, I mean, they were close. And I had to teach this, and so it was very, very natural for me to take the teaching and, and try to make it narrative. And when I was trying to make it narrative, I naturally did the same thing Gordini does here too, is I merged the sense of incarnation with a sense of self-emptying, because they were self-emptied in grief. And I wanted to meet their grief with the doctrine, see? So that's what I did. That's, it's ironic. Uh, and I tied so much of the incarnation into this willingness of Jesus to take on suffering. I even used the Pope's uh, document on suffering at length in the class. But I tied it into doctrine, okay? And I can remember having some discussions with other people who taught religion there at the time about the Pope's document on suffering. Uh, and of course I had a bit of a different take uh, than some others did on that, interestingly enough, but that's a side issue. What also happened is in teaching all that, I had the notes from that, and then I took those notes and adapted them when I went to the war zone in Uganda in 2005 to give the retreat I gave there. I used the material from when I was teaching the tutorial in Trinity. So if I hadn't encountered that very vulnerable suffering of those students and in trying to teach doctrine to them, I never would have had the notes that I taught to the catechists in the war zone in northern Uganda. So it really, it was a situation where God uh, did something way, way beyond anything that happened uh, uh, in any of the given uh, simple iterations of the time. So, but this, the, when I read Guardini here, and he's, he's combining the teaching on the Incarnation with the kenosis, uh, I'm reminded of that experience of teaching those children doctrine right after that uh, young man died. 
In the eternal Son, Guardini continues, who was God and his Father's equal and fully conscious of that equality, stirs a desire beyond all psychology or metaphysics to empty himself of his glory and omnipotent bounty in order to descend to us as one of us. Jesus came down, quote unquote, not only to walk on earth, but to penetrate to depths we can never measure, to the abysmal vacuum we know only after we have been genuinely personally shaken by the full consciousness of what sin is. What is it? I mean, colon, what sin is? Colon, destruction of the victim, with a capital V, who expiates, redeems, and renews. Wow. You see? That when we, he goes on, when we speak of the price of redemption, we usually think of Jesus the man, of his human heart and body and soul and all that salvation costs them. If we consider God in relation to this act, then usually only to add that his immeasurable sublimity in the divine person of the Savior is what gives Jesus' human sacrifice its all redeeming power. At the preposterous idea of God's suffering, man stops short. What? God suffers? And, by the way, he, that is man, is right. How could God suffer? We must not humanize him. And yet, says Guardini, something is missing. The plumbless earnestness of salvation ceases to be a full reality, says Guardini. It ceases to be a full reality when we imagine Christ on Calvary in untouched exaltation. Absolutely true. What we are about to say is false, says Guardini, semicolon. I'm, I'm, I'm reading the punctuation just to give you an idea of how this follows. What we are about to say is false, semicolon. Yet, statements seem to exist that are untrue but indispensable. Okay, so... This is really where mystery hits language, right? It's what we are about to say, he says, is false, yet statements seem to exist that are untrue but indispensable. And, the, and what Bardini is saying, this is one of them, okay? Our salvation was not something God could bring about with a detached and effortless gesture. That's not how God works, okay? According to Guardini, semicolon. He felt its full weight. St. Paul speaks of kenosis. There's that word, self-emptying in Greek. Comma, God's emptying himself. And there it is again, Philippians 2, 7. For there, not Jesus the man is meant, but the Logos, okay? The mysterious decision of the divine to cancel his own being with a capital B in order to assume the nature of a slave. This is, this is hard to get your head around. And it seems, it's just so difficult. We find it difficult and it is difficult, right? So we have to stand back from it and think about it and ask the Lord to help us, okay, to understand it. But these are, these are difficult words 
I'd say. Let's read them again. For there, not Jesus the man is meant, but the Logos, that mysterious decision of the divine, with a capital D, to cancel his own being, with a capital B, in order to assume, quote, the nature of a slave, unquote. So Gordini is going to try to help us unpack this. So he starts in the next paragraph. There are many varieties of nothingness, says Gordini. First of all, the clear and simple void meant when we say, God created the world out of nothing. This means that God was all in all and that there was nothing besides him. The simple non-existence of any lip thing, okay? Then, says Gordini, came man's test, and he failed, and sin. Sin is more than mere blameworthiness. Man does not live because he happens to exist, as does the animal or stone. He lives toward the fulfillment of the good that is in him. That's important. Man lives toward fulfillment of the good that is in him. Through voluntary obedience to God's will, he is meant to realize his full capacities. Okay? Once man sinned, he was not the same person he had been before. Only guilty. But his whole existence, down to the roots of his being, became questionable. Instead of living towards God, he fell from him. Now he exists only in his headlong plunge from divine plentitude to nothingness. And then there's a semicolon. And not to the pure, comma, positive nothingness that anticipated creation, comma, but to the vacuum that follows on the heels of sin's destruction. So here's the contrast. There's the, there's the kind of nothing-nothingness that's at the root before creation, okay? Because God created everything out of nothing, as only God can do. No, this nothingness is not that kind of nothingness. This is a vacuum created by sin. And, and it's, 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 it's much more sinister than the nothingness at the beginning of creation. The pure nothingness, as Gordini talks about it. It's a pure positive nothingness, says Gordini. I know, this language is, is like out of this world. And you have to kind of accept that. You've got to kind of flow along with Guardini a little bit here in order to in order to to to, to get it I got that and and it, it please it, the the rule that I said at the beginning of the readings here with Guardini is if it's just too much for you go to the next paragraph and be patient because uh, uh, this could get to be kind of too much this distinction about nothingness but it has to be dealt with here because Guardini is trying to make a point about sin, and that's the point he's making, and that, that's the point we want to underline here. The destructiveness of sin. God, I remember one time, I was at a funeral of someone who died in a tragic car accident, and the people who worked with him uh, in, uh, were there, and uh, we're at the at the funeral and the, the graveside service and at the end they're just kind of standing there so they loved their co-worker very very much he was he was very much a christian brother to them too they were not only co-workers but they were all uh involved in a in a in a group movement together in, in the church and uh so it was it was they were close they were very close in this particular business and one of the other people, partners in the business, was standing there at the end of the funeral. And he, and he looked down 
and as he was ready to walk away from the casket, and he shook his head and he said, this is what sin does. I'll never forget that. See, these were profound believers, like Gardini, who himself is a profound believer. And when he said that, it made a very, very deep impression on me. And that's what Gordini's trying to get at in this distinction between positive nothingness from which God created everything and this vacuum nothingness that comes from sin. So I, I highlight it with that story to underline it for you. Gordini's trying to get at the horrible nothingness that comes into our lives, the vacuum, the abyss that comes from sin. And that is, that, that, that's what happens. Okay? And that's what Gordini's getting at. He says, but to the vacuum that follows on the heels of sin's destruction. He says, such destruction is never complete, for man who did not create himself cannot completely destroy himself through sin. Nevertheless, total destruction remains the goal toward which the curve of existence ex eternally plunges. And that's what that guy was getting at at the end of the funeral service. This is caused by sin. Right? It is this immeasurably terrible and distant point, quote-unquote, that divine redemption had to reach. And then Gordini puts a parenthesis in there, naturally not by sinning personally, but by emptying himself. Okay? So how did Jesus become sin, like St. Paul talks about? Not by personally sinning, but by emptying himself into the condition of sin without sinning. And that's kenosis. Okay? Gordini continues, to abandon himself to the void, to destruction, not his essential annihilation, says Guardini, but the destruction meant in Matthew's saying, quote, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That's in Matthew 10.39. This is Christ's sacrifice, Guardini says that God took this sacrifice made possible and necessary by sin upon himself, not only Jesus the man, but the incarnate Son of God. This is the truth that Jesus' act on Holy Thursday so poignantly reveals. He who knows himself Lord and Master assumes the duty of a slave and we catch a glimpse of that potent nothingness which overtakes and stops the abysmal plunge away from God. That's why Holy Thursday is important because in that act Jesus is pointing the way out of our abysmal plunge away from God. Out of the death that comes along with sin. That's what's going on. That's what Gordini's highlighting. Wow. Notice, it is the nothingness from which the second creation is born, says Guardini. Creation of the new man, his face toward God, and once more participating through grace in sanctity and reality. Like humility, also Christian sacrifice begins not with men, but with God. Just as the only, only the great and saintly can practice truest humility, only the wealthy and all-powerful can practice purest sacrifice. It is this divine virtue of sacrifice on which Christian sacrifice is patterned. Okay? No wonder the disciples are perplexed. Everything is really upside down, says Gordini. By comparison, all human reevaluation of values is child's play. Okay? That's really true. The earnestness of Jesus' act 
is perhaps best measured by his remark to Peter, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. If I do not wash thee, thou shalt have no part with me. Peter must participate, that's the key word, in the mystery of divine surrender if he is to share in the life of Christ. For it, the mystery of divine surrender, is the kernel of Christianity. That is why the Lord adds that as I have done to you, so you also should do. The disciples are not only to learn humility and fraternal love, they must actually participate in the mystery. Every Christian, this is, this is one of the more profound paragraphs of Gordini, and I'm just going to read it, and you'll see why. It's very profound. I don't think I can add anything to it, but hear it. Every Christian one day reaches the point where he too must be ready to accompany the Master into destruction and oblivion, into that which the world considers folly, that which for his own understanding is incomprehensible, for his own feeling intolerable. Whatever it is to be, suffering, dishonor, the loss of loved ones, or the shattering of a lifetime over work. That is the decisive test of his Christianity. Will he shrink back before the ultimate depths, or will he be able to go all the way and thus win his share of the life of Christ? What a question. And then now he adds, adds another statement right after that. What is it we fear in Christianity if not precisely this demand? What is the demand? I'm going to read it again. Whatever it is to be, suffering, dishonor, the loss of loved ones, or the shattering of a lifetime work, this is the decisive test of his Christianity. Will he shrink back before the ultimate depths, or will he be able to go all the way and thus win his share of the life of Christ. What is it we fear in Christianity if not precisely this demand? That's why we try to water it down to a less disturbing system of ethics or Weltanschauung, worldview, or what have you. But to be a Christian means to participate in the life of Christ, all of it. Only the whole brings peace. Only the whole brings peace. The Lord once said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not do not let your heart be troubled or be afraid. That's from St. John 14, 27. Peace comes only from living this through to the end. One way or another, we must brush the depths Christ divinely plummeted, taste the dregs he drained to the last drop. It is consummated. That's in John chapter 19, 30. From this unreserved realization of the Father's will comes the illimitable peace of Christ also for us. Do you see? It's in that willingness to be a Christian, to participate in the life of Christ, not just boil it to some ethical demand or some worldview demand, but to take on the call of doing the Father's will completely in the power of the Holy Spirit. If we do that, with that kind of level of surrender. That's what brings peace, according to Vordini. From this unreserved realization of the Father's will comes the illimitable peace of Christ also for us.
remember? In His will is our peace. Thank you very much. And that, remember, in His will is our peace, is in Dante. And it's also quoted by St. Augustine. I'm, in His will is our peace. Matthew Arnold said that that was one of the highest points of poetry in the history of the world. But it fits Bardini's insight too. Thank you very much. <laughs>